right, welcome to Earth's notes, notes Earth Space style. Um, you'll notice if you're looking at your paper copy of your notes that they are graphic organizers. So you're going to only want to write down your bigger ideas and summarize because you will always have this copy of this notes. We're going to put emphasis on test items. We're going to repeat those, bold those. Um, and then, of course, you'll always have this YouTube channel for notes as well. All right, so week one notes, what do we need to know? Kepler's law number one, the orbit of a planet are ovals. There are planets, there are comets, there are whatever. It is always an oval shape. Um, the fancy word for that is ellipse. You have the formal definition in your notes. For my picture it reminder, I put a circle and an oval. And that's because a circle is a special kind of ellipse. Um, all circles are ellipses, but all ellipses are not circles. So it's uh, better to just write um, uh, to write ovals. Um, we draw circles by putting a, a fixed point in the center and then uh, drawing a, you know, using a string or something to draw around it. But ellipses actually have two of those and they have two foci instead of one. So it's mathematically perfect oval. Um, in orbit, that sun is going to be at that focus and then the comet or the planet or the satellite, whatever, is the other, is the other piece. Um, it might look like this for uh, for a, a planet with the sun at one focus. Um, here's a quick little movie clip here. Let's see if I can't get that to play. It's simply a matter of looking at things in the right perspective. Any circle, viewed obliquely, appears as an ellipse. In the most graphic terms, a piece of string and two pens illustrate the simple elegance of an ellipse. Since the string doesn't stretch into a different length. The total distance from one pin to the pencil to the other pin is constant. A single point is called the focus. Two points, the foci. And you do not need to know the difference between a focus and a foci. This would be a good place to stop your video and write out your say it word summary and your picture it reminder for Kepler's first law. All right, then law number two uh, says that a line joining a planet or comet and the sun sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time. Really what that means is the planet moves faster in its orbit when it's closer to the sun. Um, we do ask that you know these two words that are in your notes there at the bottom of that square, perihelion and aphelion. Perihelion is the point in the orbit where the planet is closest to the sun. Aphelion is the point where it's farthest away. I use alliteration to remember this, so perihelion is pretty close and aphelion is away. Um, if we are in the uh, spring semester, um, we, you're probably watching this in January, and that means we're just moving out of perihelion. Um, if you're watching this in the fall semester, we are coming up on perihelion. Perihelion for Earth happens on December 21st. Um, what does this law mean? Well, here's a picture that you could put in that picture it area. Um, what that means is the triangle here, if we were able to, you know, put a piece of string on the sun and then a piece of string on the planet and gave it, say, 30 days, it would draw a triangle. And then if we did the same thing, waited, you know, uh, half of the planet's year and then did the same thing on the other side, you'd get this short, fat triangle on one side and this long, skinny triangle on the other. It would take the same amount of paint to cover this triangle as it does for that triangle. And so you, um, you ha that's why it's called equal areas. If we did the math on that, it would be the same. Same thing, doesn't matter what side the focus is on the sun, um, it will always be the same. They would be equal areas. Um, so here we see a l another little video I'm going to show you. In fact, in flying from one place to another in the solar system, we use one of Kepler's laws, which tells us that the planets move around the sun on ellipses, and the spacecraft will follow exactly these, these same laws. So you'll notice that as it, was in, uh, as it was nearing this point in the orbit, that planet moved faster. Another way to think about that might be a softball pitcher. She swings her arm around. If this is her and this is the ball, it goes really fast when it's close to her body and appears to move slower as it goes out this way. Um, that would be Kepler's second law.
And then, of course, the question is always, well, why? Why would that work that way? Um, there's lots of factors to consider. We're only going to focus on the astronomy ones, um, and so we can partially explain that by the universal law of gravitation. This is a good spot to stop. Make sure that you have your own word summary for Kepler's second law and your own picture for Kepler's second law. When we return, we'll be on the next page, where, on the back page there where it says the gravity laws. All right, so coming back, we're starting with uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation, and his law has three things. Number one, if it has mass, it has gravity. So um, if you can hold it, touch it in your hand, then it has gravity. And the thing is, is mass matters. This is something that you kind of inherently know that, you know, bigger things we expect to fall faster. Well, and on Earth it turns out they don't because the most massive object is the one under your feet, the Earth itself. And so the more massive an object is, the, the more gravity it has. And then the third thing um, is distance matters. Um, the closer two objects are, the more gravity they have. And so that's kind of gravity in a nutshell. Um, what that means is um, the more, uh, you know, if you jump, where are you going to land? Well, you're going to land back on Earth. Why? Well, we're closest to the Earth. Um, even though the sun is much, much more massive, we don't get sucked off into the sun because uh, we're so close to the Earth. The sun is massive enough, though, to keep us here on Earth. And this works to help us explain Kepler's second law because the force of gravity is going to be greatest between the planet and that sun when they're closer together, when they're at that perihelion point. Um, you might wonder then, well, why don't I stick to my fridge when I walk by it? Or why doesn't the teeniest, tiniest freshman in school, you know who they are, um, stick to that big, huge senior, you know who they are. Why when they pass in the hallway doesn't one stick to the other? Well, there's something much, much more massive under their feet. And so mass matters and distance matters. So I'm just going to say it again, mass matters. Anything that has mass has gravity, but the more mass it has, the more gravity it has. And distance matters. We fall back to the Earth, not the Sun, because we're closer to the Earth. Um, and this all relates to Kepler's second law because as a planet is nearing perihelion, it will feel a greater force of gravity. You know, and all this reminds me of this little cartoon. Um, I'll let you look at that. This is one of my least favorite cartoons um, in, that you'll see in elementary schools. Shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. So it shows two kids jumping. And a little girl lands on the moon, but her little buddy gets, he lands among the stars, all right. Yeah, so part of my humor there. All right, so it, you know, and Isaac Newton, he was cool because he, like, thought of that, but he didn't really know how it worked. It wasn't until Einstein came along. I mean, this, that's a lot, lot later um, that we actually figured out why it would work. And so Einstein came up with this theory of the bent space model. Anything with mass bends space. So if you kind of imagine graph paper all over the universe going in every direction. So imagine that grid going up and down and left and right and front to back and diagonally and then put a rock on that grid. And as that rock touches the grid, it bends it downward or bends it a little bit. But it bends it in all those directions, left and right, up and down, back and forth, diagonally. And um, so it bends that space. And what happen would happen is more massive objects would kind of stay put, and the less massive objects would roll down into that bend. Um, and so we'll do a lab this week. Here's kind of a picture of that. Um, what I like about this image is it shows that bigger object, you know, bending the space more, and these little objects don't really seem to bend it that much. Um, but one fallacy of this image is that in outer space we can have things that are very, very small still be very, very massive. And things that are very, very big don't have to be so massive. Um, and so that's one image. Um, another image is of, is of a waterbed, um, and you'll find a, another link on Blackboard there that shows a waterbed prank. Um, I apologize if you speak German because it is uh, it does curse in German. So, um, and those objects do bend space, and it has a little bit of a chuckle for the outcome. All right, here's a good spot to pause. Make sure you have your 
uh, gravity laws, um, the say it columns filled out. For picture reminder for Newton, I wrote aim for the moon. I also have the apple tree because Newton's always uh, always kind of pictured with that apple tree. For Einstein, I wrote the words waterbed. You could draw a picture like the one you see on your screen now. Um, but uh, in order to understand my waterbed comment, you may want to go watch that YouTube video of the waterbed prank. Um, and then, so there's a good time to pause, and then when we come back, we'll do Kepler's third law. All right, so for Kepler's third law, um, says the period of a planet increases rapidly with the radius of its orbit. T squared equals D3. First off, don't memorize the equation. Don't need to. Um, and the word period here, that means really the planet's year. It's the time it takes for the planet to make one revolution around the sun. Um, and so what this law says is the bigger the oval is, the longer it takes to go around, which, you know, makes sense. If I'm going to West Roads from Westside High School, it's only going to take me like, what, 10 minutes? But if I'm going to Mall of America from Westside High School, that's going to take me more like five hours just because Mall of America is in Minnesota. It's so far away. Or if I think of a racetrack, I want the inside lane, not the outside lane because I'm going to have a better time. Both of those are about the same as Kepler's law, third law of planetary motion. It takes longer to travel a larger distance. Um, and so here we have an example of Mercury, only 0.38 AU, which is an astronomical unit, which is something that you don't need to worry about, uh, away from the sun. Uh, its period, or its years, 88 days. If we look at Neptune, about 100 times the distance from the sun, but we look at the period, 60,266 days. It's not 100 times 88 it's 685 times the period. So the period went up a whole lot faster than the distance did. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to see if I can go ahead and pull up that video for us on um, here. No sad media not found. All right, I'll link the other one to Blackboard, and you should hopefully be able to find this is what the first little thumbnail should look like on the bent space model. All right, good luck. Let me know if you have questions.